Πέτερ είναι θεωρητικός και φιλόσοφος των μέσων με αρκετές, αρκετές δημοσιεύσεις και αρκετές παρουσίες σε διάφορα πανεπιστήμια συν της άλλης και το Πανεπιστήμιο Χούμπολ στο Βερολίνο. Ε, ε, από τον Νοέμβριο του 2012 είναι Short -term, Term Fellow στο Διεθνές Ερευνητικό Πρόγραμμα Πολιτισμική Έρευνα και Φιλοσοφία των Μέσων με θέμα μοριακή κυβερνητική και η μεταφυσική της. Ουσιαστικά αυτή τη, σχολ... αυτή τη στιγμή ασχολείται με ένα βιβλίο ε, το οποίο αναφέρεται στο έργο του σημαντικού βιολόγου Ζακ Μονό. Δεν ξέρω αν το γνωρίζετε, είναι ένα από τα πρώτα βιβλία που εγώ έχω διαβάζει τον μικρό παιδάκι. Τύχη και αναγκαιότητα, πιθανότητα να σας λέει κάτι. Το ενδιαφέρον είναι ότι δεν είναι μόνο ένα βιβλίο περί βιολογία, αλλά και ένα βιβλίο περί επιστημολογία. Δηλαδή ο τρόπο με τον οποίο γνωρίζουμε αυτά που γνωρίζουμε. Ένα από τα σημαντικά θέματα και το δεύτερο σημαντικό θέμα με το οποίο ασχολείται ο Πέτερ είναι αναφορές στην, θα λέγαμε, ποιητική δύναμη της φύσης, μίμηση και μίμικρη, θα ασχοληθεί και ο ίδιος, θα αναφερθεί σε αυτά. Σε γενικές γραμμές, λοιπόν, μια νεότερη θεωρία των μέσων, μπορούμε να μιλήσουμε για τη σχολή του Βερολίνου, ε, στην Ελλάδα ακόμα δεν έχουν έρθει πολλοί αυτά τα πράγματα. Όσοι έχουν κάποιες προσβάσεις, πιθανότητα να γνωρίζουν. Ε, η Γιούλια Στράους είναι πιο γνωστή, έχει και μια μεγαλύτερη παρουσία στην Αθήνα. Ε, το έργο της είναι ίσως σε κάποιους γνωστό. Να πω μόνο ότι την πρώτη φορά που γνώρισα τη Γιούλια ήταν ε, η χέρι στο σπίτι. Ε, ε, καθόμασταν μπροστά στη βιβλιοθήκη, βρήκε ένα βιβλίο. Ένα βιβλίο το οποίο αναφερόταν σε, σε αρχαίους ελληνικούς ύμνους δίγλωσο από τη μία, στη μια σελίδα το αρχαίο κείμενο, στην άλλη σελίδα η νεοελληνική μετάφραση. Και αυτό που έκανε η Γιούλια με το που πήρε το βιβλίο ήταν να αρχίσει να τραγουδάει. Ήταν, το βρήκε ιδιαίτερα περίεργο, αξιο, αξιο, άξιο περίεργο, όχι περίεργο, άξιο περίεργο και ρώτησα πώς γίνεται αυτό. Ώστε με μίησε στα μυστικά της ονομαζόμενης παρασημαντικής. Τι είναι αυτό, είναι ο τρόπος με τον οποίο οι αρχαίοι Έλληνες χρησιμοποιούν τα γράμματα το γνωστό μας αλφάβητο, για να υποδηλώσουν νότες. Στην αρχαία Ελλάδα τα, το αλφάβητο χρησιμοποιείται για τη γλώσσα, για το λόγο δηλαδή, για τη γραφή, για την ακρίβεια, χρησιμοποιείται προφανώς για τα μαθηματικά, το γνωρίζουμε από το σχολείο, και χρησιμοποιείται και ως σύστημα μουσικής, μουσικό σύστημα. Όλα αυτά λοιπόν στο έργο της Γιούλιας είναι σημαντικά. Υπό αυτή την έννοια και η Γιούλια ασχολείται με, ανάλογο, με ανάλογες θεματικές, αν σκεφτούμε ότι η γραφή είναι μέσο, ένα είδος δηλαδή τεχνολογικού μέσου, ξεκινάει από τη γραφή και τελειώνει προς το παρόν τουλάχιστον στους σύγχρονους υπολογιστέ. Αυτά τα λίγα. Θα έχουμε τη δυνατότητα να μιλήσουμε και μετά. Είναι ένα, μια διάλεξη, μια performance και μια παρουσίαση. Το ένα μπαίνει μέσα στο άλλο. Lecture performance, performance lecture και όλα αυτά μαζί και στο τέλος θα κλείσουμε με μία συζήτηση. Nicht Sie, die Seligen, die erschienen sind, die Götterbilder in dem alten Lande, Sie darf ich ja nicht rufen mehr. Wenn aber ihr heimatlichen Wasser jetzt mit euch des Herzens Liebe klagt, was will es anders? Denn voll Erwartung liegt das Land und als in heißen Tagen herabgesenkt, umschattet heut ihr Sehnenden uns ahnungsvoll ein Himmel, voll ist er von Verheißungen und scheint mir drohend auch, doch will ich bei ihm bleiben und rückwärts soll die Seele mir nicht fliehen zu euch Vergangene, die zu lieb mir sind, denn euer schönes Angesicht zu sehen, als wär's wie sonst, ich fürchte es, tödlich ist und kaum erlaubt, Gestorbene zu wecken. Όχι τους μακάριους που είχαν φανερωθεί, είδωλα θεών στην αρχαία γη, αυτούς δεν πρέπει πια να τους καλώ. 
Αν όμως η αγάπη της καρδιάς με σας τώρα θρηνεί, νερά μου πατρικά, στο ιερό της πένθος, τι άλλο να επιθυμεί. Γεμάτη προσμονή απλώνεται η γη και ναρκωμένους λες από τον ήλιο τον καυτό, νερά νοσταλγικά μας ρίχνει ο ουρανός, τον νης και οστοργικό. Γεμάτος είναι η υπόσχεση και δείχνει επίσης απειλητικό. Μα εγώ θέλω κοντά του να σταθώ και πίσω δεν θα, δε θα τραβηχθεί εμένα η ψυχή. Σε σας πεπερασμένη, βαθιά μου αγαπημένη. Γιατί το ωραίο σας πρόσωπο να βλέπω, σαν να ήταν όπως άλλοτε, φοβάμαι, είναι θανάσιμο και ανάρμοστο τους πεθαμένους να ξυπνάς. Where are the goddesses and gods? Actually, where are they? Where is the actuality of goddesses and gods? In what consists their actual? And why is it so deeply desired, especially during the 20th century? There is no general speaking of goddesses and gods. They have names. When in springtime 1967, on April the, the 4th, Martin Heidegger came to Athens to give a lecture in the Academy of Arts and Science, he first invoked Athena to help him making his talk. In a hidden ritual, he performs from the very beginning an actualization of the goddess. Here in Athens, he says, we ask for counsel and convoy, rat and rat und geleit, from the former patroness, the Schutzherrin of the town and the Attic country, from the goddess Athena. Then, he reminds the auditory of two Greek artworks which are supporting his whole speech. Two famous reliefs of Athena. One of the metopes of the Zeus Temple of Olympia. You know it. Athena, unseen behind Heracles, helping him to support the firmament while Atlas is bringing the golden apples from the Hesperide. And second, the famous Athena Skeptomene from the Acropolis Museum. Athena has a notable kind of actuality or presence. Hans Walter Otto, in his book on the gods of Greece from 1929, names Athena the always near, indifferent to the, always, to the, to the far away Apollo. In certain famous situations is expressed her character to be suddenly present. In the Ilias, she stands behind Achille, looking at him while with ardent eyes like fires, just in the moment when Achille going to beat Agamemnon after his offensive speeches. Achille feels her, turns round, sees in her eyes and hesitates. So all is decided in another way. Or, by contrary, in the decisive battle against the suitors, she suddenly stands on the side of Odysseus in the shape of Mentor and tells him to begin right now the battle. She immediately disappears. Odysseus sees her as a swallow flying in the roof. On the Atlas Metope of Olympia, she stands in the same way behind Heracles, 
this time to reinforce Heracles in holding the sky. Athena is Polymetis. She's born from Metis, the conscious, the prudent, and that in a rather archaic way. Metis was pregnant from Zeus. He divorced her, and so Athene was born in the stomach of Zeus, and, as you know, went off by his head. But finally, her character is not at all archaic. She is not a warrior-like shield woman, not like Ares. She reigns by lucidity of her few. She is Glaucopis. As such, she assists the works of art and techne. She helps Jason building his ship, building a wooden horse. She gives golden reins for the horses of Pegasus. As such, she is the origin of art. Herkunft der Gunst, the title of Heidegger's um, speech. She is the goddess of techne, which comprises art, technic, and a certain kind of knowledge in the same time. But all this is philology, archaeology, history, and not actuality. So, in the second part of his speech, Heidegger tries to outline an actuality. He names it simply cybernetic and gives insight in some structures of cybernetics. He does it in a language of his own, because in all technical notions he deciphers the philosophical tradition, the history of metaphysics. First character of the cybernetic world is, with Nietzsche, victory of the scientific method over science. At stake is a pure procedural logic not an ontologic. The last state of this is called cybernetics. But in the center of all, and in difference to what he developed in the third is about Galilei, for instance, in the center of all stands transmission, mediation and retransmission, response. The two are informing every process. All that is called feedback, Problem. He takes it very concrete as running back and forth, forwards and backwards, running as a circuit and running in a circle. That is important because in 1929 he described the animal, the pure world of animals, as one completely encircled by orbitals, rings of pulsion driven by Triebe. And he describes all that with a proto-cybernetician Jakob von Uxk. In 1967 it is an Aristotelian allusion to the philosophy of movement, which makes the mood music. Automation of musculoskeletal system. And from this, disappearance of any difference between living beings and machines. All that concerns finally man himself, his so-called anthropology. He himself becomes a regulatory circuit consisting of man and world. That's the state of former Daseins analysis. And where does this happen? Above of all in biochemistry in the science of the living cell in genetics. These are defined, so Heidegger, by their stored prescription, the program of a development. Science already knows the alphabet of this prescription. April 1967. That means, and he does not name it like he names Athena, the DNA. Only Lacan played once with the French acronym ADN and he heard Adonis in ADN. The gene structure of the germ cell is one 
is of the, is on the same level as the nuclear fragmentation of physics. And to mention it, in the same year, um, 67, the Nobel laureate Jacques Monod, founder of the molecular cybernetics, by the conception of his so-called operon model for regulation of gene expression, gives his famous inaugural lecture in Collège de France. There, he depicts a, the, provo the provocative picture of a scientific existentialistic nihilism. And he ends with, what kind of an ideal should we propose the man of today? An ideal above and beyond him. And there is only one possible, the conquest, the recapture of the nothingness that man himself has discovered by objective cognition and knowledge. The cybernetics of 1967 are the last state and the essence of the whole history of metaphysics. The industrialized society itself is the last subject, the peak of subjectivism beginning with Descartes. And the circuit of feed bad control is on the other side a closed circle, an encirclement, a caginess. He names it explicitly a captivity, a imprison, imprisonment. Man is locked, encircled in his scientific technical world, and this encirclement seals any experience of history as such. But where is there the actuality of Athena? The gods flee from cybernetic world. But here he resets again Athena as the address of another beginning. He invokes her to mark otherness of a beginning. And art is the thing in solidarity with Athena. Art is Athena art. He exemplifies this by another artwork, Athena Skeptomene, which you're holding in your hands. What is she thinking about in this relief? Perhaps you know much more about it as me than me. Is she meditating a list of deaths on the stone, a list of gifts? Is she meditating, as Julia Strauss supposed, so to say by a profession, her own future Agalma, her own sculpture? Heidegger loves or is she meditating the borders of her tenenos, her territory? Heidegger loves this version and immediately changes the meaning. She meditates the boundaries of a shape, of a morphe, of a gestalt in general. That means not only the morphe in arts, but also the morphe of natural things, of mountains, islands, coasts, olive trees, all that in the light of the Greek landscape, shining out of herself and her Glaucopius eyes. Heidegger, the unique pres presence of things in this often mentioned light. In Athena, art is together, physis and techne, techne and art, knowledge and techne. But what kind of beginning is that? A contemplative, a pensive beginning, and so is the, the kind of art it generates. To get out of the actual encirclement, Heidegger, probably the thing is not to break through, to crash through the cage, the caginess. It means no liberation by crashing, tearing, disrupting. Because thinking as such and itself is decisive, is an event beyond the separation of theory and practice. It is to open the 
and settlement. Well, well, all that seems very nice and it ends up with a rather conservative and somewhat harmless aesthetic. But 1967 was not only the year when a Nobel laureate exposed molecular cybernetics as metaphysics or for nothing. In summer 1967, Heidegger received in his Schwarzwald cottage the visit from a poet, from Paul Celan. He, Celan, vividly asks the historical political question of Heidegger's philosophy. Simeon Stampulu wrote in extension about the event of this visit and its consequences. My hypothesis in the second part of my speech will now be the following. The actuality of the goddess Athena 1967 is so harmless because it has no political surrounding. That means no perspective to political action, whatever. The world civilization is the end of politics, also in thinking against it by referring to Athena art as a kind of another beginning. And only in 1934, Heidegger is able to think fundamentally new beginnings. He himself calls them sometimes revolutionary. In this sphere, art is thought from a political condition, a political surrounding. And that leads to a completely different border, limit, shape or gestalt. The shape of a political entity, creating or founding a new state. And all that is closely linked to the hymnic work of Friedrich Hölderlin. Just after being the first Nazi president of the Freiburg University, Heidegger begins in the winter 35, 30, 34, 35 to talk about Hölderlin in the university lecture about the hymns, Germanian and the Rhine. And Hölderlin's uh, hymnic poetry stands exactly at the place of Greek artworks, but he never thought so concrete and extensive about Greek art as about Hölderlin. And what comes out of this in terms of the actuality of God? First of all, the fact that Dionysus and not Athena is ahead of this other, other beginning. The practical question is, 34, how to obtain, how to purchase God's to a completely and deeply de-Christianized de nation. How to introduce gods beside religion, beyond religious institutions? The answer? Only a poetry-guided philosophy can bring it back. Poetry philosophy is the only place to do that, care for gods and administrate them. The main problem is articulated already at the beginning of the hymn, Germania, you just heard from Sotirios in the Greek translation of Simeo and Stampulu. The gods disappeared and it's not possible to reawaken them. Hölderlin is, so to say, confronted with a zombie problem. <laughs> it is horrible to reawaken the dead. But how to make a revolutionary new beginning by introducing new gods? New gods that are old gods, very old gods. Heidegger, following Hölderlin, evades and starts not with the gods, but with the demigods. Halbgötter. The demigod is the one 
who not only speaks about a new beginning, but he does it. He's a founder who institutes, endows, donates a new world. He's a creator. Not in the order of making, but in the order of donation. Stiftung. I said, the powers of poetry of thinking, of creating a state, in times of deployed histories, they are acting back and forth, and it's not possible to calculate them. But the demigod is the poet. In fact, it's the poet to do this, in a broader notion of the poet. He's a poet of the revolution. I'll try to translate. The poet undergoes poetically the creative breakdown, the creative doom of the old truth. That means in complete dissolution. He is captivated and torn away by juvenility and by the new powers. But it's interesting that Heidegger abandons his rereading of the first hymn just before the turning point of this poem, when the messenger, the medium of awakening, arrives, the eagle coming from the Indus flying over the Parnassus Heights, over Italy and the Alps, to arrive finally in the German scattered regionalism of the beginning of the 19th century before Napoleon. No, Heidegger turns to another hymn, which talks about a river, a stream, the Rhine. This is because here he can think the problem of the beginning in a very concrete manner, the beginning as a source. And from this point deploys the whole current, the fate of the river. What does it mean? First, it means to ask the question of the beginning in terms of physics, geography of the source, terms of geology of sources, or botany, in the case of Rhine, the Evi, the Efeu, Kisos. Not so superficial as uh, the shape of the olive tree in the Essenes discourse. He deciphers Kisos as the plant of Dionysus. He, Dionysus, reigns over the hold, singing about the stream. He is the stream and his be beginning. And you know, Dionysus, more than all other gods, had a controversial beginning, controversial origin. A mortal woman gave birth to him, Semele, daughter of Cadmus. A rather archaic story. Semele would have liked to see Godfather Zeus, who was in love with her. He came in the figure of a thunderbolt. She died, but Zeus protected Dionysus, cooled by, the, by wrapping him, him in Kissos. The philologists dispute whether this is an Asian or, or a secondary in, invention. Heidegger likes the hypothesis that it's um, an old god. But then, after the birth, comes the youth of Dionysus. His way of appearing, the raves, being disjointed in ecstasy. Instead of telling you things you know much better than me, I'll speak again a stanza of a Hölderling hymn. Drum ist ein Jauchzen sein Wort. Nicht liebt er wie andere Kinder, in Wickelbanden zu weinen. Denn wo die Ufer zuerst an die Seite ihm schleichen, die krummen und durstig umwindend ihn, den Unbedachten, zu ziehen und wohl zu behüten begehren, im eigenen Zahne, 
Lachend zerreißt er die Schlangen und stürzt mit der Beut und wenn in der Eil ein Größerer ihn nicht zähmt, ihn wachsen lässt. Wie der Blitz muss er die Erde spalten und die Wälder ziehen ihm nach und die zusammensinkenden Berge. Γι' αυτό είναι η λέξη του αλλαλαγμός χαράς. Δεν θέλει τις φασκές, σαν τα άλλα παιδιά να κλαψουρίζει. Γιατί όπου οι όχθες αρχινούν, στο πλάι του, σαν φίδια να κλειστρούν, τυλίγοντάς τον όλο δίψα, να τον τραβήξουνε τον άμυαλο, γυρεύουν με τα δόντια τους και να τον προστατέψουν, γελώντας. Σχίζει αυτό τα φίδια και με τη λία του μαζί γκρεμίζεται. Και όταν στον καλπασμό του άλλος δεν μπορεί πιο δυνατός να τον δαμάσει και τον αφήνει να αγριέψει σαν αστραπή σχίζει τη γη και τον ακολουθούν πιστά οι δρυμοί και τα βουνά, βουλιάζοντας σαν μαγεμένα. I hope you could hear it a little bit. First, this Dionysian transformation of the riversides themselves in Kisos, the thirsty twinning around the stream, then the going wild, the raving, not only through the woods and over the mountains, but the woods themselves follow the madness and the mountains break down in a sort of mimicry, in a vortex, in a panic, taking them with it. It is a fundamental eruption, a sort of violent chaos. Not the sensible world of Athena. And from this, in Aldrin's poem, is finally born the shape of a world. Father Ryan constructs the country, he even makes economics, he nourishes his children and founds towns. But now it is not the limit of a shape, of a gestalt, of an artwork, but the dynamic, the real border of a stream making political entities. In 1801, the Peace of Lüneville is signed, which erects the Rhine as a so-called natural border. And now I come to the end. And the actuality of gods in the 21st century. There's a book, which in the processed movement of our days enjoys a sort of cult status black book. Edited like a Mao Bible was written uh, <clears throat> in 2001. The title Cybernetics and Riots. The authors or the author giving themselves the artificial name Tikkun refer several times to the Athen lecture of Heidegger. They analyze the present state of things as the time of second cybernetics. The first wave in the 50s and 60s of Heidegger, they did use it historically. Information series, the basics of cybernetics coming out of blitzes and atomic explosions of World War II. Exactly there is born this utopian dream of communication, complementary to the atom, atom energy and the fusion top bomb. Tikkun what is at stake is always to reach total togetherness, either by excess of life in communication or excess of death in case of the fusion of atoms. The second cybernetics is described by the communication revolution, media and so on. But then they go through all political movement of the 60s. So far many protest movements worked without knowing it for a new state of cybernetic power. The utopia of self-determining of the citizen movement and so. The citizen concepts the nothingness of his life as an uninterrupted chain of projects to realize. Participation is a new state of the second cybernetics and it generates one thing that is full transparency 
not only an NSA, but the always self-documenting individuals in the net are transparent for economic circuits of the capitalism. And in the end, the cybernetics of total communication is self-transparent, like consciousness. Noosphere, semiosphere, infosphere regulates themselves without humans. And where can there be seen other beginnings, resistance to this world of regulation? There's only one chance against transparency. And this is fog. Fog. Resistance by opacity. Not only the opaque will only the opaque will open the encirclement by the full transparent communication. Or second strategy: deliberately produce states of panic, and open for the panic. Panic is the opening against the cage of cybernetic control. It generates vectors of escape, fleeing lines. But it does not come from the outside, but from the inside. They use a scientific model. Ilya Prigozhin developed in the um, 70s his theory of branching points. And this theory ends not with order out from chaos like um, in Heinz von Förster, but in toppling of one state in an unpredictable other state. Well, all these strategies, the Tikkun authors name it active chaos, against the tyranny of transparency. And they went for this an acronym called ZOO, Zones of Offensive Opacity. Zone d'opacité offensive, aggressive opacity. Zo, like zoon, from Greek word zoe, the being of living beings. In other words, the physis. But is there any actualization of a goddess or a god in all that? The possibility of a new beginning by recursion to old beginnings, in the sense of my three steps. I tried to make um, 1967, 1934, 2001. Heidegger ended his speech 1967 here in Athens with Heraklit. Physis krypte stai filet. The physis likes to hide herself. And then talking about the open, the light, the transparent of Athens against the hidden, the opaque which has no name. But should we address to the escape from cybernetics as proposed by Tikkun as a Dionysian one? Could that help anything? Is the situation of 213 really the same as 12 years ago? Tikkun didn't know the actual state of communication and how to generate riots by communication. It all was written before the riots taking place everywhere after 9-11. The Occupy movement and its different forms of actions and aims and places, the refugee movement bringing Africa in the heart of European metropoles, the pussy riot movement against Russian state politics. It is difficult to describe all these situations in terms of actualizations of gods. But now Julia will tell us something. I don't think it's so difficult. We are in the middle of a process of horizontalization between the gods and humans. And where are the gods? They are right between us. They are in the gatherings. of responsible human beings. Heidegger starts his speech in Athens with thanks. And he asks himself, how can we thank? And he answers, we thank by thinking with them. And here with, I would like to thank 
Georgia Zagri for talking to me last time in Athens, Athens about the real solidarity. The real solidarity is um, our key, the key that will help us that the global revolution will succeed. Or as a um, um, member of the Autonomous University in Berlin, Daniel Mützel puts it, it's love towards the resistance of the other. <laughs> Welcome in my studio, Daily Lazy. I'm sitting here as, like, in the same way as I'm sitting in my studio in Berlin. So, at the moment I'm co-curating an exhibition called Global Activism in the Center of Arts and Media in Karlsruhe. And what I do in my studio is this. I select the works, but I do it always from this perspective of my new beginning, which started in Athens, when Sotirios Bachtetis brought me with the Lyra and uh, I saw the riots. This is the politics of visibility that changes the world. And artists have a new role in it. And in return, there is a tectonic transformation in contemporary art going on. <laughs> Works by the artists selected for the exhibition. Mark Bill. It's Christian Graupner. He turned the heads of the cats, so now they are saying bye to atomic energy. <laughs> and it's a huge campaign. It's not only these cats, and these cats run on sun batteries. It's a very, very big campaign. They are small and big in different countries. This, this uh, Four objects were put underneath of this monument. It's in the city of Minsk in Belarus. The artist, Mikhail mm, Gut, mm, Gutlin, um, he put these objects there and he was arrested for doing this. <laughs> the monument was for an, like nobody knew what this moment is and the name of the person to whom the moment is, is not even written. But he was arrested and he had a horrible process and the objects were confiscated by the police. <laughs> this is an amazing work by a um, Russian St. Petersburg-based artist Olga Zhitlina. She created a game, a real game, in which you can follow all the steps of becoming a citizen if you are a refugee and if you come to Europe. Everybody can understand what it's like to be a refugee with the help of this game. These are works, they are made out of um, wasted dresses. <laughs> Tradition. Um, Ursula Xyriaks, innovation. Also, she has made um, a, a campaign, a call, for people to bring the threads they don't need to one place <laughs> and to do this to all the industrial horrible tubes in the cityscape. So they have completely transformed the entire village. They've done it by themselves, the citizens. This is a catapult made by the Blockupy, by, let's say by Occupy Frankfurt people. They came to Berlin and built this beautiful catapult and they threw the book, what is it called, German constitution book, with the help of catapult, into the parliament area behind these uh, gates, behind the fence. Or Noah Fischer from Occupy Museums in New York, he has made these coins. Um, coins are manifesto currency. The one on the left side, Masters of Fine Arts, it's um, about the debt, debts. So mm, this new coin is a new value for the artwork and it's actually changing, revolutionary changing the idea about the value of the contemporary art. And what I especially like about it is that it is still a sculpture. So it's not that the artist has become, become a neoliberal, you know, NGO uh, 
kind of, uh, so to speak, slave sitting at the computer and being an activist, but it's the debt that Noah himself has. This is 71,851 and so This is his personal debt, so that's a new value. This is what you have to borrow from the bank when you want to study. These are the debt the debts fair, debt fair stations, and you can even like uh, scan the codes. You see the tape can includes the codes, and you can participate in the real um, debt fair by scanning them. This is um, still sh shot from a film by Lizette Olivares. She has made an investigative um, video about the farm that uh, Wilm Delvoye, famous Belgian artist, has done in China. And it was supposed to be very humorous and uh, funny that uh, he was doing tattoos of the pigs. And this pig skin was sold on the auctions for very, very high prices. And actually, she went uh, and her colleagues went to this farm and they've seen, I've mean, uh, and they've uh, documented how horrible the conditions were, and, and it was um, actually basically the message of the film is that it's not very funny that the pigs were tortured there, and that there is no border between human beings and animals, and that it was a very problematic, ethically problematic project. This here is um, a friend of mine and an activist from St. Petersburg. This is what he has done with himself after Pussy Riot have been arrested. Uh, Pyotr Pavlensky. This is Lampedusa and this is Light Tower in Lampedusa. It's by a sculptor and um, former RIF member uh, Thomas Kilpa. And um, this was built for the refugees to come and it has been a social center for the orientation of, re of refugees when they arrive. These are Spanish activists, I don't know how to find them. They have made the cabins for voting right inside the bank, because there is no difference between economy <laughs> and politics. <laughs> this is done by me. It was a projection from my place. It's called, this is basically what you would see if you would be in my studio. Um, it's called, uh, it's called Illegal Laser Projection. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the eve before one of the solidarity actions. The policemen tried to pass, I mean, tried, <laughs> they've passed seven times, but they haven't seen it because I had um, a guest from the um, Occupy movement and he was very fit in, you know, discovering the police cars driving into the street and so I could stop for 20 seconds. This is the making of. This is our occupation of Pergamo Museum. You will see a short video if you are not too bored. Anyway, you will see it. But I will. I mean, we have occupied it to talk about the um, colonization and purchased resistance because this is a resistant as altar which is built to resist at the moment to resistant. This is Ekaterina Samutsevich. She is one of my hero activists because she came out of the prison. She is a member of Pussy Riot, but she was the one who programmed her own freedom by being smart enough to fire the lawyers. <laughs> this is Darlington. He is a refugee, one of the people from the refugee movement in Berlin. And this is um, Vera. <laughs> Um, what's your name, Peter Bertz? Peter Bertz, what's your name? Vera. Yes. Vera Figner. Figner, exactly. Vera. One of the founders, one of the inspirational figures for Russia, first nihilist. Inspirational figure for Nietzsche, first nihilist. <laughs> this is a human rights activist, Martina Steiss. She is a key figure in the pussy right move, uh, free pussy right movement. This is what the rainbow looks like in Warsaw. The uh, homophobic people have burned the rainbow already now for four times. This um, expresses the fact that there are bo no borders between our movements and that's what I was talking about at the beginning, about the real solidarity um, and about love towards the resistance of the other. And now, maybe if you want, I can show you 
short excerpts from the videos. You want to see short excerpts from the videos or are you tired? Yes! Yeah. <laughs> mm. Come on guys! <laughs> so, okay. Um, this... Um, for somebody who is present here, I have to show this excerpt. It's, um, it's a fictionary news uh, about is not the sequence of nows rolling into just a second that bends back into itself this is the temporality of becoming this is very different than the ontology of being. <laughs> the monument to the junkies of ammonia, this young man made out of black marble holding a syringe in the hand, among with the other statues in the new Acropolis Museum, are frozen. They are in the state of coma, but they are not dead. Sculptures and junkies are this kind of socially not considered. They are excluded from the social field, what another philosopher has called the homo sacca. With this project, we want to go to all places of what is often called, in a broader sense, the Mediterranean basin and revitalize them, creating again all the Athenas of the world of now. For that, we have created this wonderful catalog and I'm inviting you to have a look. These are the projects of the future, these are the projects of now. <laughs> The workers of Acropolis Museum are installing the, the monument to the junkies of Ammonia. The opening. <laughs> Other venues. Manos Giapitsakis on the photo, who is present here. But look, this I'm not going to show you. It's I'm singing the hymn to police. And for this. We are, we got into a hospital and this is our doctor who is present here. It is a big momentum of transition, a change in art that starts from Athens. I am very happy and proud of the artists in Greece. They have deep knowledge and are not driven by the art market, but by the gods. It's over soon. I just want to, to, you to see the doctor. <laughs> we are in a military hospital where it's not allowed to record, huh?
Για τρέμουν πώ είναι, πώ είναι η κατάστασή του. Τα σχετικά δεν είναι σχετικά, τι λέτε. Τα συμπτώματα τη νέα κανονικότητα, αυτή τη υπερκανονικότητα θα λέγαμε, είναι τα συμπτώματα μετά την πολιτιστική επανάσταση εποχή. Πρόκειται για κάποια υπερσύγχυση για την εμφάνιση ενό καταράκτη εικόνων είναι ίσω το τέλο του λόγου. Θα μπορούσα να ονομάσω αυτή την ασθένεια νέα ζωτικότητα. Για τρέμε, ξέρετε για την προηγούμενη δραστηριότητά του στην Ελλάδα. Ξέρετε ότι πολλοί προσπάθησαν να υπονομεύσουν αυτή τη δραστηριότητα, να, να αποδομήσουν αυτή τη διαδικασία και να την παρουσιάσουν ω τρέλα. Ε, με την πραγμάτωση τη πολιτιστική επανάσταση, αυτή είναι πλέον η κανονική κατάσταση. Ο νέος μεσογειακός νόμος εγκατάργησης της χρήσης των χημικών από την αστυνομία δεν έχει τεθεί ακόμα σε εφαρμογή. Το ξέρω, γιατί το ξέρω και είμαι πραγματικά συντετριμένη, γιατί μέχρι χθε είχαμε φοβερή δουλειά, είχαμε γένεια χθε και δεν πρόλαβα να κάνω τίποτα. Η αστυνομική ήταν πλήρω εξοπλισμένη. Εντάξει, εντάξει, μην ανησυχείτε. Έχουμε ακόμα κάποιε ενέσει από την αυταρχία. Η ασφάλιση του το καλύπτει αυτό η γερμανική, γιατί εδώ οι άνθρωποι δεν είναι ασφαλισμένοι. Όχι, όχι, δεν χρειάζεται ασφάλιση. Μετά την πολιτιστική επανάσταση, για κάθε άνθρωπο ή ζώο ή πλάσμα που είναι τη Μεσογειακή Λεκάνη, υπάρχει καθένα δικαιούται δωρεάν ασφάλιση και ιατρική περίθαλψη. Ναι, ήταν μόνο το πλάνο να το δείξει, αλλά έχω δει την Αγή και ήταν χρειαστικό. Τώρα θα δείτε τι θα γίνει. Θα δείτε μόνο δύο μικρά βίντεο. This one is just a short statement. Also was recorded in my studio. They criminalized us. They deport us. They put us in jail. But we are still fighting. No freedom of movement. No freedom of speech. It is the global fight. There are no borders between our movements. We are in solidarity with the Pussy Riot. Freedom of movement it is everybody's right. We are in this granite. We are proud of the unity and the We are not about fascism. We are not the rights of the unity of the We announce abortion to the fascism. We are for the world without borders. And now comes the last part. The Refugee Song, <laughs> composed by Marius Boch and Dallington and Idris and Vajdi and others.
Oh, 